join us on the Path Radio Mix online. And to get there, type in thepathradio.com. That's thepathradio.com. And enjoy free streaming music all day long. That's it. thepathradio.com. All right, now let's get to the main show, the monthly social podcast with me, your host, Guido Perino, as you go on with Guido. Happy April, everybody. April showers bring me flowers, and so too, hopefully, does this podcast bring you some bright and sunny days and information. I've got a hot podcast for you today. Stanley Cup champion, author, motivational speaker, former Montreal Canadien, Ryan Walter. I've got some special music from Billboard charting artist Franklin McKay. Hobbyist uh, Carlo Giuliano is going to talk to us about tuning up our bikes for the summer. Tell you a little bit in my story of how it relates back to Ryan Walter and, and some personal failures that I've overcome, and hopefully you can too. And if you stick around to the end, just like last time, I've got a special bonus for you. All right, let's go. All right, before we get started today, I wanted to tell you a little bit about one of our Promote Ontario slash Canada small businesses. Today's show is brought to you by Chaser's Juice, a fresh juice experience with 100% fresh pressed plant-based juice. It's juiced and delivered fresh daily with over 300 juice products to consider. A perfect serving for restaurants and businesses alike, a hit at corporate events, and kids and healthy conscious people love it. To start your Chaser's Juice fresh experience, give them a shout at 416 416- Two five nine one five five seven, or check out their website at chasersjuice.com. All right, let's kick off our first segment with Ryan Walter. Folks, huge amounts of insights here. I'm really excited for you to listen to this. Let's have a go. I'd like to welcome to the April podcast, multi-time author, former NHL coach, Canadian women's hockey gold medal coach, TV color commentator, Stanley Cup champion, motivational speaker, and I'm sure I'm missing several uh, other accolades, Ryan Walter. Ryan, thanks for doing this with us. How are you today? Hey, Guido, really good. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Oh, you know what, Ryan? It goes. This goes without saying. It's a great honor for me to have you here. Uh, you are the second Montreal Canadian player that I've had the opportunity to speak with in a personal manner. Uh, the first being the late Jean Beliveau. Uh, although in, with him it was in person, I'm sure this will be uh, just uh, as much the equal treat for me as much as it will for, for our audience. Well, thank you. And you, that's a great story about Jean Bel- Beliveau, so congratulations. Oh, fa- I, you know what? Thank you. I wish I could have met him again, and uh, he, was, he was quite the gentle giant. So, Wonder, he's a wonderful man, Guido. Yeah, I, you, I mean, you spent time with him, right, Ryan? We did in Montreal, yeah, in those years. And uh, he was still involved with the team and just a, a great ambassador of our game. It, it was this, quite the sight to always see him behind the bench, like motivationally speaking, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I enjoyed watching him play, too. Right. <laughs> but, but, I'm a, but I'm an old-timer. So. <laughs> Well, I had to I had to go with stories that my brother told me about Jean, um, yes. and and of course I I was indoctrinated as a as a Montreal Canadian fan by my brother as well with all of all of the uh, the folks that came up after that. So, you know what, Ryan, we're, we're talking hockey here, but I, I want to ask you I want to ask you something. I want to get it out of the way. Um, I've had some friends in the past play pro hockey. Yes, and. Um, <laughs> when we when we got together, um, you know, they, we rarely talked hockey. Um, in fact, they used to say it was a nice escape from the conversation. Um, so when someone asks you to have a talk like like I have here, does any part of you think, you know, I hope I hope we don't have to spend a lot of time talking Canadians or, or hockey or or is it still a thrill? Like, is it still a thrill for you? Yeah, you know, I think. Um... I'm not sure, Guido, it's a thrill, but it, but it is an honor. You know, uh, our, my career, you know, finished up in the early, in the uh, early 90s. 
uh, with the Vancouver Canucks and uh, 93. And, uh, you know, broadcasting, lots of stuff after that. But it's just an honor to be a part of the NHL and and to be sort of in a position where we get a chance to think about it and remember it. Until you take me back, <laughs> I don't spend, you know, probably, this is going to sound weird, I probably don't spend 1% of my day thinking about hockey or wow. the NHL uh, just because we're, doing leadership development we're writing books we're you know building portals we're developing courses so we're really active in today and tomorrow and uh so it's fun when you take me back that's uh i i'm glad that i'm glad that you're doing this and i'm glad that i could take you back and that is um you know enlightening for me to hear too you know you're focusing on the today and the tomorrow um, not forgetting, not forgetting. I mean, fifteen NHL seasons, right? Um, not forgetting about the past either, I guess, right? So, I, I guess then you have a set of friends where hockey is not the center of discussion by rule or circumstance, either way, <laughs> right? And and uh, you know, you pull out the memories when when it's time to pull out the memories, which is a treat. Is a treat to do. So, yes. Let me let me get a hockey, like I guess a hockey hockey question out of the way and bring you back a little bit. Um, I'm sure a lot of folks want to know because it's where you spent the bulk of your career. I want to know <laughs> what what will you remember most about playing for the Montreal Canadiens? Well, I think uh, a couple things. You know, I'm glad you said most because that means I don't have to have one. <laughs> you know, one one big memory. I mean, certainly winning the Cup in '86 when you get a chance to, you know, to. For anybody to win a championship, it's uh, powerful. But uh, I think for me, it was a lot around the process, you know, to get the win. And the Montreal Canadiens had a way of teaching their players, and it was just passed down from player to player. There was no playbook. You didn't, when you got traded to Montreal, you didn't get a book that said, listen, hold yourself this way. <laughs> and treat the fans this way and, you know, play the game this way. Um, like most things in life, you know, you catch it. Uh, and you got to be watching and you have to be listening and you have to watch players. But there was a Montreal Canadian way. And I think that that's one of the things that I've really enjoyed sort of thinking about is uh, part of that is that there's going to be tough times and you're going to lose. But, you know, I've heard somebody say recently a good thought. You know, your next win uh, is, is very dependent on your last loss. So the idea of losing well, what do you pick out of it? What do you learn from it? Do you dwell on it? Right. Do you live in it? And maybe this is the big one for the society that we live in today, is do you personalize it? Mm. So many people, you know, lose, and then they, they call themselves a loser. And uh, Pat Quinn, my great coach in Vancouver, oh, wow. had a plaque. Yeah, Pat had a plaque in his coaching office that said this, um, a, a failed project is not a failed person. <laughs> and I think, Guido, that that process of learning how to win was really the thing that I'll take away from Montreal. It's interesting because as, as you're saying that, I'm thinking to myself, and, and you mentioned some of the stuff you're doing today, Ryan, already. Um I, the word culture comes to mind, and I know that businesses today often grapple with the idea of culture. Um, I, I certainly can't relate at your level, at a professional sports level, but at a team level, I've been part of different teams, and I know we've had uh, that that culture or that the, the passing of a torch where we didn't have a playbook either, but you learned when you got there by watching and listening and, and yes. emulating what other others were doing that were being successful, but also, and I, and I think this is important, you mentioned 
also when they were losing, what were they doing? How yes. how were they losing, and what did they do with the loss, and how did they move forward? Um, yeah, I think I think really that's a great point. It's all about culture, and that's what culture is. Culture is how you live, and you know um, how you lose, and how you win, and you know how you treat each other, and what kind of team do you want to be part of? So for sure. And I, when you said culture. It hit me. You know what's funny about culture, and we do a lot of work around team culture, is when you have a really good culture, you talk about it. (laughs) And when you have a really bad culture, everybody talks about it. Yeah. The only difference is a good culture, you tell everybody. A bad culture, you uh, it's all hidden. Right. Right? People talk, but it's behind everybody's back. And it never gets better. Right. It's it's the opposite of the customer experience, right? Well, the, the customer experience is if you have a bad experience, you tell everybody. <laughs> but, yes, exactly. <laughs> but if you have a good experience, it's 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 not. It doesn't go as far. It seems. So when you when you talk about that um, that feeling or or that. Um, you know, just just listening and learning and 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 adopt, you know, getting into that Montreal Canadiens culture. Did it when you put on that jersey the first time? Was that was that an experience? Was that a, a an aha moment for you? Or yeah, it was a, it was a wonderful experience for sure. Uh, but it had a, a bit of an overshadow that I want to share with you. Sure. When I was traded with Rick Green from the Washington Capitals to the Montreal Canadiens, right. we were traded for four players, uh-huh. England, Jarvis, Lachlan, and Hall of Fame player Rod Langway. Yep. So the headline in the Montreal Gazette when Rick Green and I landed in Montreal was worst trade in <sighs> NHL history. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> yes, playing that first game with the jersey was powerful. But here's the learning. Here's the lesson. I lived that headline for a while. Mm. I personalized it, right? Like, I, I thought, well, why don't they like me? And I, that's a big grow-up time for me. And so, you know, I sort of underperformed for a while. And, uh, and then I got my head straightened out and got focused on how I could play because I was obviously a good player. They, yes. they traded for me, and yep. the year before I had scored 38 goals. Yep. So that first game had a little bit of a backstory, a little bit of a shadow over, I would say, the first 33 days of that season. So... Let, let me ask you this, and, and that's an interesting, it's an interesting story, and it's sort of a lot of foreshadowing in that, right, with some of the stuff, again, that you're doing today, right, a, a learning, a learning yes. curve, right? Um, an old high school teacher of mine who's no longer around, he, he had said something to us, he taught me something, and he said, you know, when, you, when you're in the big game, when you're, when you, whether you've won or you've lost, but in your, you're in the big game, or you're in your first game, or in your last game, he said, don't be in a rush to take off your jersey, Remember that moment. Yes. Is that is that true for anything? Like when it comes to NHL, or is it is it different? Yeah. Yeah. yeah no. No. For sure. You want to remember the experience, and I think that's how we felt when we finally got a chance to win the cup in '86. Right. You, you never wanted to go to sleep <laughs> because because you knew when you got up in the morning the feeling would be gone. And so, yes, I, I think there is a sense of, you know, enjoy the jersey, enjoy the season. Enjoy the moment. Like, relish it, and then learn from it, and then try to replicate it. So, how did you get, how did you land on number 11? I, you were number 9 in Washington, right? Yeah, only one reason. <laughs> for sure, and retired number 9 in Montreal, so there you go. Oh, so, just 11, 11 was the next one up? Yeah, that was the only one available. And you know what was cool? That's a great question, Guido. We were not given the... I wasn't given the choice. Oh. The management just picked it. They just, they just gave you the number? Yep. Yeah, management picked the number. Huh, interesting. I'm sure, I'm sure some players go in and say, 
listen, you know, I'd like to have number 17 or something. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, maybe because I didn't say anything, maybe they just picked it from him. But hey, I showed up and I was number 11. It's, it's worked out. It's worked out, Ryan. Um <laughs> So listen, for generally, I, so I, I don't typically start with those types of questions because my, my podcast is really focused on, on helping people in, in, in many different ways, let's just say. Um, one of the first yes. questions I usually ask is, is um, you know, for the purpose of helping the audience connect, if they're pursuing a, a career that, that might be similar, I always ask, can you provide a bit of a career story? You're, you're unique in that, you know, you've had multiple career evolutions. You're, you've reinvented yourself many times. Um, it's, it says something about, I'm going to use the term staying hungry. Uh, I've been reading your book for the audience. I admit it. I've, re- I've been reading the book. Uh, so it's an intentional reference with, which Ryan has authored. But let, let's start with hockey. Was, was being a hockey player your first dream? Um, you know, how did you stick with pursuing that? Maybe take us on a little bit of a career journey to, to where you are today, um, if you can. Yeah, we'll do it in a bit of a chronological order. We, you know, I'm a, a kid from Burnaby, British Columbia. That uh, think about Burnaby. I mean, it, there's no ice in Burnaby. You know, the light doesn't freeze in Burnaby. You know, there was one time in my whole my whole life that Burnaby Lake froze enough for us to ski on it. And so, if you wanted to enjoy the game of hockey in Burnaby, British Columbia, there was one arena. And you got up early. So if you're going to get up early, you know, 4 o'clock in the morning to get there for a 5 a.m. practice, then pretty quick you're either going to really fall in love with the game or you're going to say, let's stop doing this. <laughs> so so I just sort of fell in love with the game. And I didn't really, I can't remember a time later where I said, oh, I've got this big dream. I, you know, I want to be like Guy Lafleur or... You know, Larry Robinson or the guy, I literally just sort of, you know, enjoyed the game. I enjoyed the dressing room, enjoyed competing, I enjoyed the coaches. And uh, so I just kept going. At 15, at 14, instead of playing uh, Bantam, uh, they moved me up to Midget. Hmm. And, and when I was supposed to be in Midget, at 15, I ended up making a junior hockey team at Langley. At 16, I played in the playoffs of the Western Hockey League and blew my right knee out. And that was a a huge, uh, looking back, a huge indicator of what might happen because, and I I don't take the credit there, but here's what happened. Uh, That knee so so badly damaged that the doctor said that I would never ski again. Wow. And when we worked hard on the knee, they repaired it surgically and I repaired it just through hard work. That probably, the pain that it took to get that knee back probably told me that I could do anything. Mm-hmm. I, could, I could play in the NHL if I wanted to. And at a thousand games and played at the NHL level, my wife Jen and I were on the ice with our kids. <laughs> And, you know, I just, I had a flash of those two doctors, Dr. Smiley and Dr. Polson, you know, helping me have this moment. So, 17, I'm rehabilitating the knee. 18, I have a really good year. 19 years old, I score 52 goals, and I'm drafted number two in the world. Right. I end up in Washington for four seasons, Montreal for nine, and Vancouver Canucks for the last two. Right. And then broadcasting, and I did a master's degree in leadership business, went back to school in the mid-40s, and for 25 years, Jenny and I have been, really, I would call it a training slash coaching uh, corporate teams and executives across the world. And that's really a large part of our passion right now. I, it's funny, you, so you just said that, and I, I wrote down two things while I was listening to your journey. I wrote down perseverance and passion. Yeah, yeah and, and the, the first one is, uh, as you're reading the book, uh, we finally had to write about it. <laughs> and our most recent book is called Hungry, and sort of trying to give some ideas, some practical 
ideas on how to stay hungry and yep. you know as people weather this covid thing and they you know they struggle through hard times we don't guarantee people soft lives we know their hard lives right but the beauty is is if we develop those skills that you learn quickly in sport we can get through those hard times yeah, I, I think I think when you're saying that, I keep bringing it back to, and you said it a couple of times, you you loved what you were doing. And, and pandemic or no pandemic, if there's things that I love to do when I when I get out of bed or when I when I wake up, my outlook for the day changes. Whether whether it's career or whether it's whether it's simple things or, or whether it's career, and it, and it seems that you've applied that through your career evolutions, uh, Ryan. Um, I agree. I agree, Leo, and I just give credit to, you know, there's there's a faith component also in, in our lives. And I think that that has really helped me because, you know, we, Jen and I have both um, sort of discovered, I think is the best way to put it, uh, the Christian faith. And, and what that's done is, you know, you start to think of key words, right? That you can't live without it, like a word like hope, right? You know, and, and so and love and things like that. So I agree with you. If the right ingredients are in your life, then then really, you know, you, you can you can weather a lot of storms. So I was going to ask you this a bit later, but but you brought it up. So I'm gonna I'll come back to my other questions. I'm gonna fast forward to a, to a question I was gonna ask a bit later, um, sure. and it's around it's around faith. Sure. In an article uh, that Stu Cowan of the Gazette wrote back on October 26, 2012, the title of it was Ryan Walter Combined Religion and the Code of Hockey. And, and in that, you talk about a story when you were on an airplane that I guess unexpectedly dropped in altitude for a few seconds. And you were quoted in that as saying, I got off that plane thinking, gee, is life all about goals and assists and winning Stanley Cups? If the plane goes down... Can you really know that you're going to spend eternity with the Creator? That really began my search for looking at the Scripture, the New Testament, and just really trying to understand what is the spiritual dimension that I feel in my life. And I, so I'm reading this and I'm thinking to this, wow, and, and you're in sport, and, and this is way back when, right? It's, things are a little bit, they've evolved and they're a little bit different. How much back then even, like as you had that experience, did spirituality factor into your game and I guess you've kind of answered, it's there today and into what you do today. How, how much of that is, is part of it? Yeah, you know, and thank you for allowing me to answer that question. That's a great question. I think on the ice was uh, the crux, right? Like, like uh, I never wanted to be one thing in the dressing room or one thing with Mitch Alley or one thing, you know, walking down the street and then another thing on the ice. Now. Mm-hmm. The ice is a bit of a tough crucible. It, things happen, and somebody punches you in the face. You know, most most of us react. You know, with with fight or flight. Right. So I'm not saying that I was perfect there for sure, but I'll give you an example. Um, I ended up in Boston in the early '80s in a big scrap with Terry O'Reilly. <laughs> And, and uh, uh, he was beating me up pretty much. And then when we fell, I, I was on top. And I was going to get, you know, the greatest punch of my life. You know, the toughest guy in the NHL. And he looked up at me as we fell and he was on the ice. He couldn't move. And he said, Ryan, he said, Wally, my shoulder's up. And I said, no problem, Terry, I'll get off. And I said, because I'm tired anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and Terry uh, went on to write, like to, to tell the reporter in the newspaper, wow. came up the next day, that I had, I had not finished him off because uh, I was apparently one of those born-again Christians. <laughs> uh-huh. and, and the reason I tell you that story is not to illuminate me i think the, the greatest thing that happens when 
you have faith in Jesus is that you start, it's an amazing thing, you start not having to be better. You start changing from the inside out. And that decision for me to let Terry up was one that was growing inside me. It was a little spiritual seed that began to change my behaviors. So yes, it did impact all of that for sure, we don't, and it impacts today. Like Jenny and I have values that we feel are important. And when we do work with clients, we want to make sure not only do we not, you know, um, move outside of the values of the companies that we're working for, but also that they don't move outside of the values that we hold. Right. So it does impact all parts of our life, doesn't it? It, it does. And, and I, you know what? I've said thanks to you for being here, but thanks for sharing because that's a very personal a very personal moment and a very a sort of personal um, view um, that you're opening up and sharing with us was, if I may, was was spirituality that was there was it ever a barrier with teammates or was it the opposite? Where, did you have situations where folks said, uh, "Hey, you know what, what's it about?" or or did it play into um, uh, teammates or or one way or the other, uh, Ryan? Yes, we know both. Both. So, so some teammates didn't understand, you know, why I wasn't at the, the strip joint with the group. Right. Or, you know, maybe down uh, pounding beers with, you know, half the team. So there was no doubt that some of the guys wondered if I was a little bit crazy. And probably, <laughs> that's probably a good thing to wonder. <laughs> But uh, there's a, another group of guys that were sometimes those same guys that, you know, when t- when times are tough and when they're, you know, their family had cancer or something, right. that they, they would come up and ask Jenny and I to pray for them. Right. And, and, you know, why is it so important to you? And I remember one teammate would say to me, you know, um, hey, Ryan, do you have your Wally? Do you have your Bible with you? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, well, what does it say about this? Uh-huh. And so, yeah, I think both sides. I think it's, it's a, you know, I, the goal of being, at least for, from our perspective, the goal of being a Christian is, is not to say to everybody, you have to live like me, you have to right. do it my way. The goal of being a Christian is to honor Jesus in whatever you do. Right. And because he gave everything for us. That's a that was a good moment to to pause and just think about that and I appreciate that and I agree and I know I know that by today's standards it's not an easy topic um, when when we start talking religion and things like that so uh, I appreciate that I appreciate you sharing that with me Ryan and, thank you, and everybody and thank, and thank your your listeners yeah. for allowing me to share that because you know I mean you and I have lots to talk about but what you just brought up you know is uh, primary in our lives you know we we show people how to change skills from a leadership development point of view but no we can't show people how to change their hearts yeah i and you know what it's important the the topic itself was important to me and to be honest uh my brother actually um when when i told him i was going to do this he said you know um you know, Ryan Walter was very was very big on spirituality, and and you should look into that a bit. And I said, you know what, I'm going to. Um, you know, we are pre pandemic. Uh, we are a a, a faith, the church going family. We haven't been able to go to church because of the pandemic. So we do things like we do things like download the masses on YouTube and and you know do these other little exercises. And and it's not quite the same. I admit that I I enjoy the service and I miss going. So I'm looking forward to doing that. Um, and I do. You know, the other thing that I thought of with the with the faith and the spirituality thing was. You know, in the book, you often say the hungry spirit, and and I thought, hmm, are you is the, is the spirit part part of that? Are you are you drawing in on that when you're saying that sort of thing? So, <laughs> yes. So, so with that, um, you know, 
um, the, the journey and, and um, the career and the spirituality, um, there's another facet that I want to touch on here. One of the challenges that, that people face, um, and, and, you know, sometimes in religion, sometimes in career, sometimes in life, is, is failure or the perception of failure. Um, in your book, Hungry, I, I was reading about your uh, experience as a coach in the NHL, You were let go after a successful stint with the the Vancouver Canucks. You were part of the coaching team. You helped bring them from missing the playoffs to two consecutive division titles. The power play went from 18th to 6th. Uh, Offense went to 22nd to 2nd. And and so none of that, to me, sounds like failure. And none of those sound like reasons to be let go. It it seems that we would celebrate that sort of thing. And and by the way, Vancouver for a long time uh, was was one like my second favorite team. It was the closest thing to Canadians, Canucks, Canadians. So just thought I'd throw that in there. But when when you look back and reflect and you say, "Did I fail?" What what advice do you give to people who have or are experiencing real failure or even perceived failure for for reasons beyond their actual performance? And and what I mean by that is. Sometimes even when, when you win, you fail, right? So, so yes. what, what could you say to folks? What got you through that? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, here's, here's what I've learned after, you know, with a little bit of white hair and, <laughs> you know, going, going past 62 here. Um, here's, here's what I've learned. Uh, most of our lives, we will fail. So, so get used to it and get good at it. That situation with the Canucks, I, I didn't handle well. I was so upset uh, because I thought we were going in the right direction. Mm-hmm. And I, I loved being part of it. But I also understand from my life, and everybody listening knows this in their lives, to really get good at failing quick. The, the fail is never the issue. The, the rebound, mm-hmm. right? The next step is always the issue. And, and I, I'm not saying that we should, you know, not grieve and, and not, uh, you know, not think about it and all these things we should. But, but I think that getting stuck uh, is also something that we want to be careful around. And that's been a great skill from sport that we've been able to learn is we're going to fail. So, so what's our process to get from the loss to the win? (laughs) And what's, and what's the next win? And do we get turned right now? You know, uh, Jenny and I have built a six mindset model. We call the thinking tendencies model. And it gives us, gives everybody six, sort of buckets of thinking where you can say, oh yeah, I was I was stuck there. Mm. I'm in here. And the reason we love this is the key word to leadership in 2021 is awareness. Mm. If we're not aware, we won't change. And so this idea of having a sense of what you're thinking and how to shift your focus I think is the greatest skill in 2021 for performers and leaders because we will all fail. And that's, and you said earlier, you, again, you, you mentioned earlier process and you said it again, it's, a, it's part of the process. It's part of, part of what we do, part of how you analyze it, internalize it and, and churn it out with something else. And you said you said a couple of times, sort of not getting stuck in, into where you are. And so I guess you didn't get you, you made it past it, obviously, right? Like that that experience. And you know what? I think I think I read too at one point. You around that time you were some you were having surgery or something like that too. Like you got you got double you got double whammy or something, right? I did. Yeah. Right. And and I think in your book you you know you there's a whole section where you talk about being ambivalent and and losing your purpose and your passion and things yes. like that. Did that experience you just told me that you went through that process? Did did that happen at that time? Did that happen to you? 
It did, and it was, and it, and it, you know, it didn't happen overnight. I have to say that, and I think I want to make sure that you know, I'm, you know, being upfront with your listeners. I mean, it's not. We don't snap our fingers and say, yeah. "Okay, I'm out of it. Let's go." <laughs> it, it, everybody has a different process. But what, what I'm just encouraging your listeners to do is don't see failure as failure. Because failure, you want to use it to learn. And, and you want to get better at it. Right. You know, most very successful people fail quick. Or I guess what they, they like the alliteration, they say, fail fast. Fail fast. Yeah. And, and that's probably... You know, a very good focus, a very good way to look at it, because the goal here is not to be perfect. We're, we're all we're all trying to do our best. We're going to struggle, and so out of those struggles, what can we learn, and how can we apply that next time? And I think the people that really enjoy life have that perspective that hey, let's I'm I, you know it's a little bit like Carol Dweck's on mindset where she talks about a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. Mm-hmm. You know, a fixed mindset says, I don't want to do anything wrong because people might think I'm not very good. A growth mindset says, have at it. Because if I don't figure it out this time, if I don't get good marks in school this semester, I'll work harder and I'll get good marks next semester. And I think that that type of focus is absolutely key to be in whatever, you know, sport or business or association or church you're in, is that that focus, that mindset is critical. It's, uh, it's, it's interesting to me. I really connected with, with those parts because I, I failed a lot. Like I failed a lot of things. <laughs> and, and I tell my kids, um, <laughs> I tell them all the time that um, you know I'm I'm not ashamed if if they fail something, um, as long as they're they're making an attempt and and then they're making another attempt that that they're willing to to do you know to try again but do it different or find a different way yes. and and that's where I really you know when I was reading that stuff I was like yeah you know what I have a hundred ideas and ninety nine of them turn out to be not that good <laughs> but but i keep yeah. trying i keep trying right and i keep trying different things um yeah no that's good and i'm just gonna fire this in I, a thought from michael jordan yeah came to my mind one of my favorite thoughts around this idea is some people uh and i've done this when we fail sometimes it's not that we personalize it it's just that we focus on it mm-hmm. You know, and we say, well, I'm not going to do that again because I failed at that last time. And, you know, Michael Jordan said this, and this is very instructive. He said that, um, why would I ever think about missing a shot that I haven't taken yet? Right. And really, for, for me, that's the key component is you, you, you keep, we call it a future positive focus. Yeah. You, you keep what you want in front of you and you build a process to get towards it. Yeah. Is that, I think that's, you, was that the section on futuring and, and the whole, the yes. whole, yeah, right. I really love that section too. That was, that was a very good, uh, Again, there was a whole section in there you talk about. And I don't want to give away too much stuff here, but but it's so good. You you were talking about you know the the can you imagine idea, right? And and uh, I've I love that idea, but I'm going to leave it there because I want people to read about it for, and experience it for themselves. Because <laughs> because it was thank you, man. thank you. No, it was it's really good, and I thought you know this is stuff that we can use, and and you don't have to be a business to use it. Like you can you can just use this in your personal life stuff sort of stuff so that that's why i really liked it, it you also talked you said something else that you, now you got me going you got me thinking about futuring but you're then you start talking about framing and when you when you talked about framing you said and i'm relating this to this failure to the question around failure you said that if the canadians failed to win a championship in any given season that it was a failure so yes. and, and just wrapping some context 
is that still true today? Like, if you look at the way the NHL is today, and, and we've talked about culture, we've talked about process, is that still true today? Well, here's, I think there's, there's, there's two ways to frame that, if we want to put right. it that way. <laughs> um, the first way is from a player's perspective, coaching staff's perspective, mm. and, and a management perspective, the frame that we had said that every season that we didn't win the Stanley Cup was a bad season. Mm. Not that it was a bad season, it was just an unsuccessful season. Because that was... There was so much history in Montreal about winning. Right. And so many teams in our past had won. Now, from a, from a, an external frame, if you're a fan or you're a, you know, maybe you're a, a reporter or, uh, I don't know, something else, your frame on success and losses or success and failures mm might be much different. You know, you might be following, uh, let's pick a current hero, Sidney Crosby. Right. And and the, the Penguins might not win a Stanley Cup, but Sid Crosby won the scoring championship, so you're right. happy. So I think what you frame in sort of gives you a different perspective right. on, on priority. And I guess... I guess, in fairness, equally what you frame out, <laughs> right? <laughs> Great. And Gavin O'Connor, the director of Miracle, told me that. He said the hardest part about making a movie is what not to put in the movie because it's often all good. I, You know what? You, and I just thought... I. I had no questions. I was not going to ask you about the movie Miracle today, but but you bring up you bring up the movie, right? And did 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 some of that draw into um, into your learning and and sort of yes. perceptions? It did, right? Perceptions as well. Very much. Yeah, and I really enjoyed the process of making a movie and all of that. So, you know, it was just a beautiful Disney movie, maybe the only hockey movie ever without no swearing. <laughs> so Ryan you also you you talked a little bit about coaches and and players just now and um you know when we've talked about uh you just when when you brought up the idea or the notion of what you frame in um we see players and coaches changing teams all the time um you know I'm I'm a pretty loyal kind of guy like if I pull on a jersey or I I buy into a system um, you know, I'm I'm usually all in. Um, you mentioned you were drafted by the the Capitals. You were you were made captain. You moved to the Canadians. Then you were a player for the Canucks. What does it take? Like when when you what does it take for you to um, do? I, I don't want to use battle, but to go up against. Um, you know your previous team or your old teammates or like you, what what gets you to move past the past like do you do you still when you were in Vancouver did you still love Montreal when you were in Montreal did you still think about Washington how did you battle against the people that you battled with I guess yeah those are those are very it's a wonderful question those are very tough lines I mean Mike Gardner and I were best friends in Washington mm. And for the first year or two, when we played against each other, we wouldn't look at each other, <laughs> right? We, we couldn't because we had to battle against each other. And so once you pull your sweater on, you're playing the game, then That's it. everything's on the ice, right? Like it's, it's all in. And once you get off the ice, you go to you know, have dinner together. <laughs> so it is a really... Uh, interesting perspective, I think, for fans. Right. Because I think a lot of fans think, well, you're, you must have a CH, you know, tattooed on your back end. Right. But that's not true because what if you get traded? Uh huh. You, so your loyalty is, I mean, you have to play in the moment or you have to work in the moment or you have to, to your earlier words, have peace or love in the moment, right? Yes, right. correct. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, I have great memories of all three teams, of all the players and management on all three teams. But I think in the moment, you know, I was sort of focused on some other stuff. And, you know, you, know, you picked up the word process. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's one of the great things that sports teaches business and people and lives and families is you look at the outcome desires once in a while. And they're really important. Outcomes, business plans, you know, future positive desires are really important. You have to articulate. But once they're down, and once you look at them once in a while, Mm -hmm. you must focus on the process that gets you the outcome. And that is a huge learning because I think a lot of people hope. They look at a a, a business plan and they hope that they're going to get revenue or they hope that they're going to have success or they hope that their culture is going to be vibrant. But then when you ask them, what is the actual process for you to get $100 million in this year? Right. Right? And they don't have it. So that for me has been powerful because I think a lot of people get stuck in outcomes. The process is, I'm a change, I'm a change guy. I, I love change. I love, I love building things. I love developing things. And to do that process is a big part of it because you have to, you have to know people, you have to have relationships, you have to get to understand at the core what is motivating people to do what they do. Was, was the process for you different um, as a coach as opposed to being a player? Yeah, very much, very much. You know, and all of the people that are you know, always wanting to increase or to grow their leadership capacity on this uh, call will understand what I'm going to say here. When you're a player, you get to go after the puck and you get to do it. Mm. But when you're a coach or a leader, you have to get the puck through other people. (laughs) And that is such a huge dichotomy because all of a sudden... You go from making your own success to having people that are going to be uh, the indicator of your success, and they have to do it, and you have to do it through them, and that's leadership. And I think that that was a, a great, huge learning curve for me. It's a, I guess it's a different kind of dependency, right? Like the, the, your teammates depend on you to make the pass, um, but as a coach, they're depending on you to develop the system to get the pass, right? Is that is that notionally true? Yeah. And then you know the coach is 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 you know is structurally that's true, but emotionally there's another side, right? Mm. And you're help you're trying to help your player. Uh, you know, be on the edge, be ready all the time. So, yeah, I just think there's such a strong so, connection between leadership and coaching. So you made me think there, um, for whatever reason, that the word pressure came to mind. And and you said earlier you were the second overall in the draft. You yeah. went you went to Washington. I think you were 18. I was 19. Yeah. 19 at the time. You were made. So you were 19. You were made the capital of the of the Washington Capitals in Washington, which is the capital of the United States. Um, I think you were the youngest captain in the NHL at the time. Is that at that moment did you feel pressure? Pressure is a great word, and it's it's such a going to use the word dichotomy again because it is <laughs> on one side you cannot be your best without pressure. Hmm. And you can't get into flow, which the flow state is what you must be in to be your best without an amount of pressure. But if you have too much pressure, you begin to think about it mm. and you get and you begin to under underperform. So, <laughs> 
the other thing that pressure is, obviously, is it, it's in the eyes of the beholder. Hmm. So when someone else looks at my life and they say, oh, what are you on a high pressure life? Jennifer and I do a lot of marriage uh, coaching huh. for, uh, for executives and their wives because for young executives and their wives, there's a ton of pressure. You know, you're growing a, a, a company at the same time that you're growing a family. Right. And we're finding that the pressure, talking about pressure, is important, but it needs to be in the context or in the frame. I was going to say that. You, you read my mind. Of what is pressure. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So that's uh, it's a it's an interesting um, again I was gonna say it's an interesting frame in frame out type of scenario um, but I like I like how you um, I can relate to what you're saying there in terms of um, you know uh, the careers and and how you apply it and how you view it um, Ryan uh, you know we we dance around this. Um, a little bit uh, as we go through kind of each question and I wanted to go back a little bit and, and ask you around your career transitions you're, you're now I guess if I can say I think you're more than this actually but I'm going to just say you're a motivational speaker and, and you seem to have a lot of content online you've got the RyanWalter.com site uh, you know I, you and I connected through LinkedIn um, you know yes. I know you have an email program that where you connect with people you've got this really neat thing I, I'm going to check this out I probably promise myself once I'm finished with a couple more parts of the book uh, you've got this thing called short shifts with Ryan Walter that I want to yes. that I want to check out but you've got a lot of stuff out there so so uh, tell us if you can because I said we've danced around a bit uh, tell us a little bit more about what this is all about uh, who would benefit um, and what new projects do you kind of have on the horizon that, that we can kind of look forward to yeah thank you Guido. we're really excited about where we're at we our primary work is with companies and uh, growing executive teams, growing leadership capacity, and also growing cultures. So we do a lot of work around that. Uh, in 2019, we did. I'm, I'm walking up a hill right now, so I'm huffing and puffing. <laughs> are you? I was. Are you doing land training for some reason, or is there a? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Jen, Jenny and I are on our long walk. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's perfect. In 2019. We did about 100 training sessions across North America. In 2020, we have pivoted, obviously, and I just finished. I'm, I'm at about 80 wow. Zoom sessions or over Zoom, and that training's going very well. So we're doing a lot of uh, development work for companies and for sports teams. But then, you know what gets really fun? is that this idea of coaching young executives mm. and their wives has been a real passion for Jen and I because we want marriages to survive, right? We want them to thrive. Right. And so how can we say that without helping people? Yeah, and, and, and so that's been... Yep. No, I was going to say, Ryan, and it seems that during this pandemic year, marriages have taken a hit and and so work like that is vital i think so so sorry yes. sorry for interrupting i just wanted i just thought of that and i thought what what a great thing to say during a period of, of time in our in our history where the family and the marriages are taking a hit thank you for that yeah agreed really agreed then uh, we've also made a, a bit of a pivot to online and and so our short shifts with ryan walter is a really fun eight minute video course that you that comes to your phone by text every Monday morning. <laughs> and, and it really touches on some inspirational pieces. And I like science. So I, I sometimes I'll share a story from my career. Sometimes I'll share, you know, something from BJ Fogg that is, you know, behavior equals motivation, ability and prompt. And we talk about how you can apply this in your life. So that's been really fun. I think the other thing that's coming, you're going to like this, Guido, <laughs> is is two key books. 
Oh, cool. We're writing right now. The first is going to call, be called Breakout. Okay. And it will have the six mindset model in it. And, and then we're going to look at performance language. We're going to look at team energy. We'll look at, uh, at uh, leadership focus. Oh, that's good. And then we're, we're going to call it game resilience. And all of those will come out of our model. And then the second book, I think you'll be excited about too, is uh, I've been studying the questions of Jesus. And I've been studying them because um, of the way that he led people. Hmm. So we get a chance to, you know, in 2021, a huge part of leadership is coaching. Yes. And a huge part of coaching is questions because in 2021 you want to grow the thinking of your people the science calls that metacognition yep and you can't do that without asking key questions so that that's we're hoping that that book comes out in 2021 also so you've got two of them coming out in 2021 that's the goal that's our goal right on I, that's exciting. You're right. And I, I'm looking forward to both. I, uh, things like that, you know, reading things like this for me, um, you know, as a, as a manager at work, um, not only am I looking for things for myself or, or my family, um, you know, but uh, I'm, I'm also looking for, for new ways to motivate the team, uh, help them learn, give them just different opportunities. And, and you know, even the short shifts, like, I, I need some motivation sometimes. Uh, you know, being a manager doesn't mean that you have all the answers or that you're always doing the right things or, or, you know, you need to, I need to sort of see what others are doing, what other leaders are doing and how they're doing it. And, and I think you nailed a couple of things there for me. Um, you talked about resilience. Um, and you talked about asking questions and those are, you know, the asking questions. I always tell my kids, ask questions, keep asking questions, never stop asking questions. I think that's the, the, the biggest way that we can learn is by asking questions. I like the, the spin that you have on that from a Jesus perspective as well. Um, so again, you're, you're tying back in that, that faith, uh, to, to what you're doing, Ryan. And it just speaks to, um, you know, your, your commitment and your integrity, um, which, which by the way, I think, um, you know, drives purpose and passion for a lot of people when they start looking at your materials. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I know we've loved that. And, and you know, uh, for your, um, for all the people listening to, um, pl- please don't feel like we're way out here on the West coast or we're out of reach. Uh, you know, uh, ryanwalter.com for sure. And you can just contact us there or, or just even pop me a, a note, you know, if we could ever help people or just uh, connect and say hi uh, from some of these podcasts, I've had people, you know, send me a little note and say, listen, uh, I don't know how to get to you. Can you send me your address and can you sign a hockey card for me? And so, you know, anything like that, you know, just it's just Ryan at RyanWalter.com. And uh, my wife, Jenny, and I run a very a small, personable business and we get back to everybody. I love it. I love it. And I'll say this, Ryan, um, you know, the technology that I've engaged either you or the information that and, and collaterals that you're providing to people, um, it's been smooth, it's been easy, um, and it's been and it's been fun. So the experience is, has been a very positive and good experience. And I have no doubt that uh, anyone who reaches out to you would have a, a similar experience. Um Listen, I, I can't thank you enough. I, we're, we're, we're almost approaching an hour here, but there's a couple more things I want to get out of the way, and then I'll let you go. I, I've, I've encroached on your walk with your, with your wife, no too. Problem. So um, I usually like to close things out with a sort of a rapid-fire uh, type of question. And, and rapid fire is a probably over sure. over uh, over uh, simplifying it. I, I want to say a word or two, and then the first thing that comes to your mind um, you know, you, you blurt out or, or are you up for something like that just for fun? Let's do it. All right, cool. All right, here we go. So the first thing on my mind, the Stanley cup. Heavy. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I never would have thought of that, but it was, it's, it mu- heavy. it's a lot heavier than you, than you think. Did you drink out of it? 
I did, but okay. the, the guys are giving me a hard time. I had a little bit of champagne, but mostly water. <laughs> <laughs> right on, right on. Okay, here's one. Patrick Roy. <laughs> yeah, Patrick Roy. Yeah, uh, incredible, uh, like huge intensity. Just an amazing goal. Like. Intensity. Interesting. Yeah. I like that, too. Um, family. Yeah. Oh, yeah, family. Well, wow, five crazy, awesome kids and five amazing grandkids. Oh, wow. Cool. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Um, we didn't talk a lot about this, but it's it's in your portfolio, Canadian women's hockey. Yeah, you know, the, the ladies that play for that team are just incredible, and they're amazing athletes. And uh, I really enjoyed my time there. You know, I was fortunate, uh, you know, that some of the, you know, some of the greats were still there, you know, Wickenheiser and others. And, right. and I'm so thankful for, for that, that experience. Right, because that gold medal, then again, not to, not to focus on the, the, the gold medal or the outcome, but of the process and, and just where women's hockey has gone through the years. I'm a fan. Um, it's a fantastic game. So uh, it's, it's fantastic. You're, you're, you're part of something that has evolved that way over the years. So um, how about the inner game? For me, the inner game is, you know, mind and spirit. It's the heart and it's the soul and it's, it's what drives everything. And actually, this is uh, not a very short answer. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but Guido, uh, for me, you know, that is one of my key questions that keeps me curious. <clears throat> why do some teams lose and why do some teams win mm. when they have the same talent? Mm. And for me, that's what drives me to understand neuroscience and, and to try to get, you know, a better delivery understanding of leadership because that gap is the key to not only having an amazing life we only we have so much talent but we can top or excel we can top up or accelerate our talent by our inner game mm -hmm. and that's that's a that's a i asked that question because i spent a lot of time in that section of your book where you talk about the inner game and, and I related to um, some of the things that you said in there. So I appreciate, I appreciate the expansion on that, uh, on that answer. Um, one more for you, faith. Yeah. Faith, you know, for me, it's so powerful and, and I'm so thankful that faith for me is not a, a black hole. Mm. You know, that, that says faith is the opposite of fear and, you know, you, you got to find it. I'm so thankful that faith for me is a person in, is the person of Jesus. And, and, you know, I am not somebody that is trying to be a Bible beater yeah, on yeah. other people, but this is a beautiful week of Easter. It is. And, uh, love, love people to explore. Just pick up the, the a Bible and read the Gospel of John, and read it a few times. And and if that doesn't convince you, no problem. But at least you've had a chance to look at the Word of God, and and to see who Jesus is, and you know firsthand, not not through historical hand or through a neighbor's view, but do it yourself. Because I just think that's a powerful thing. Uh, that leads us to faith. Very, very well, very well said, uh, Ryan. And again, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I know this past weekend we, uh, it, you know, it's, it's hard to find. It's hard to find before when I was a kid, when I was younger, um, it was easy to find, you know, the, the Easter stories and the, 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 you know, the movies and the, 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 the telling of the movies, uh, from a Christian perspective on TV. And they're really hard to find these days. They're, they're not as broadcast as much as they used to be. So uh, we fired up. We threw in the, the Blu-ray on um, the Ten Commandments. And we watched, we spent Sunday watching the Ten Commandments, which is a really long movie. But but um, nice. we had fun. We You know what? We, we watched it. We talked about it. Um, and then, you know, given that it's Easter week, we're heading into, into Easter weekend. We're sort of getting in that mood here, too. Um Listen, one, one last thing, and just, uh, just kidding around here a bit. Um, 
Will a dressing room ever smell bad to you? <laughs> never. 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 There, there is no smell in the dressing room. <laughs> you know, I'll give you a good example. We used to have, when I was coaching, you know, in peewee hockey and coaching our boys, you know, the, the moms would come into the dressing room after, you know, the game to, you know, to, uh, you know, help the kids with their equipment or whatever. And all the mums would come in and go, oh, that smell, it's so bad. <laughs> and, and I'd laugh and laugh because I, 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 I didn't smell a thing. I mean, that, that's, that's the smell of victory. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah, again, it was just a, a quick, quick little book reference there. I, like I said, I'm enjoying it. Um, listen, I, I'm so thankful, uh, Ryan, for your time, um, it, you know, and, and all of the insights that, that you've uh, given us uh, today tonight here um you know i i want to wish you an early happy birthday i know that's coming on later in april um it's been an honor and a pleasure to spend this time with you uh you shared your stories and insights uh some personal thank you for those um for our listeners that have has grown coast to coast in canada and it seems other people around the world are tuning in um thank you for that are there any outgoing comments you'd like uh, to leave with today I just want to thank you, Guido, for the great questions and your preparation and all of that. And uh, just for inviting me. I'd love to do it another time. Oh, I hey, I'm taking you up on that because there's like another list of stuff I wanted to talk to you about. <laughs> I forgot to. There's just so much and, and it's so interesting. So so I'll, I'll take you up on that at some point. Um, so there you have it, folks. Ryan Walter. Multi-time author, former NHL coach, Canadian women's hockey gold medal coach, TV color commentator. We didn't touch on that. Stanley Cup champion, motivational speaker, and so, so much more. Thank you for joining us. It's okay to stay hungry, folks, but figure out how to fuel your best game by checking out ryanwalter.com. The resources and links will be in my podcast notes. Today's musical guest is... Six-time Billboard charting artist Franklin McKay. Franklin has had three hits on Adult Contemporary and three hits on Christian Airplay. His most recent uh, work called Breath of Life is what you'll be hearing here today. But a little bit more on Franklin before we do that. He is uh, from Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario and has traveled the world with his music. He's been influenced by artists like Neil Diamond, Barry Manilow, Harem Scarum, and Elton John, to name a few. Here he is up with Breath of Life. Have a listen, folks. This is a really good message that ties in nicely with our conversation from Ryan Walter.
What a beautiful tune, right, folks? Breath of Life by Franklin McKay. Listen, you can hear uh, more on that and more on Franklin if you go to franklinmckay.hearnow.com. It's also available on Spotify, iTunes, Pandora, Deezer, Amazon, Apple Music. And you can check them out on YouTube and other platforms as well. I'll have all of those links in my podcast notes. Special thanks for providing that, uh, that tune to us. Breath of Life by Franklin McKay. Okay, let's keep this ball rolling. I told you this was going to be a fun, packed show, and, and it has been so far. We're going to move uh, forward now and hear from hobbyist Carlo Iuliano, and he's going to talk to us about uh, bike repairs at home. Uh, we're approaching summer, and uh, folks are taking their bicycles out with the beautiful days that we've been having uh, and putting them on the roads with their kids and themselves, and you want to make sure that they're safe, and you also don't want to throw away your bike. And Carlo's going to tell us the things that we can do at home that might be simple enough for us just to tune up our bike and keep it safe and keep it on the road instead of the landfills. All right, let's hear from Carlo. Hello, I am here with Carlo Iuliano, uh, who I've known for, for quite a, uh, some time now. And um, he's here to talk to us uh, today about bicycles, uh, given that, uh, you know, we're, we're heading into springtime. Um, over the course of the last few years, Carlo, um, he's taken up to, to fixing bicycles, as I understand, as a hobby. Uh, so, Carlo, welcome and, and thanks for doing this. Um, how did you get started with fixing bikes as a hobby? Uh, like, uh, kind of fell into it. Uh, I've always, bicycle was the biggest thing as a kid and uh, kind of held on to that idea. And uh, a few years ago, I started going out for walks with my uh, friend and his dog, and uh, we kept on noticing bicycles being thrown away at garbage night. And uh, I decided one day to bring some of them home and fix them because most of them had very little wrong with them. So you just started hauling bikes. You started carrying them on your back, heading heading home with the bikes. Yeah, it was literally <laughs> in, in, you know, a 10 block, radius, a 10 house radius, uh, you know, from my, my house. So how many, like over the course, like it would start with one bike, two bikes, like what, what are we up to here? Like what, what did you, how deep did you get into this? Oh, I, I probably have reclaimed, I would say 200. 200 bikes. Uh, Oh, 200 bikes over five years. So you're telling me that people have tossed out over 200 bikes in the last five years? Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm not, like, uh, you know, I'm, there's a lot of people um, who do what I do as a kind of half time. <laughs> there has to be more. It's, so it's whoever gets to the bike the fastest? Is that what you're telling me? Um, yeah, because anything is put out, you know, I mean, it does it. If you, if you say, oh, I'll come back and get that after, it won't be there. <laughs> Did you ever have to fight anybody for a bike? <laughs> no, no fight. Oh, good. That's good. So listen, so you're, 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 you, this started out as a hobby, but I understand that you also fix a whole bunch of them and, and you do something with charity with them, right? Like you do a couple of different things. Yeah. Um, well, like I said, a lot of people will toss out kids' bikes at the end of the season. They'll put them out for pickup, and maybe they'll need fixed on them. Uh, so I collect those and store them in my garage, uh, fix them up, and then at Christmas time, I basically put out ads uh, right, right close to Christmas, basically, uh, you know, for boy or girl, you know, whatever age the bike's appropriate for, and give them away at Christmas. Wow. Yeah, it's uh, kind that's, of a fun thing to do. That's that's really nice. So you're just putting, you know, you got your parts, you're putting these things together, uh, making some kids pretty happy, I guess. Like, do you do you paint them and all that stuff too? No, uh, just it's just a matter of most bikes are just neglected, just need lubrication, adjustments, tight, tightening here, and change of pedal. Um, yeah, especially kids' bikes. Like I said, uh, they're they're some most of the times there's nothing wrong with them, uh, and the 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 bad thing about putting something to the curb is that sometimes it doesn't get picked up and it mm. does go into landfill. Um, so by, by picking them up, making sure that they're properly working and then getting them out at Christmas time, at least they're going to get. That's awesome. That That's good to hear. And I'm glad that uh, I'm glad you're doing that. Hopefully there's others that are, are, are following suit with that. So listen, with, with a couple of hundred bikes or, or so that you're talking about, you must've come across like a, 
something interesting or where you kind of go, I can't believe that somebody put this to the curb. Like, I'm not talking kids' bikes. There, there must be something else, right? Um, most of the interesting things that I found, um, do you remember the bicycle when we were kids? They had the shifter in, in between your legs. They were called choppers. No. They had like I, a banana seat, a smaller wheel in the front, a bigger wheel in the back. I had a, I had a folding bike, but... <laughs> I, I, well, I found one of those. Uh, and, uh, and they're from the late seventies, oh, wow. maybe the early eighties. Uh, and there's a huge market for those, uh, especially in the States. Um, and they range between 500 to a thousand dollars. Wow. Um, depending like, on, the, on the condition. So this was a curbside, a curbside bike yeah. that, that is, has that kind of so these whoever put that out probably had no inclination, right? Like they just no, no, yeah, no, no yeah. clue that it was. It was just to them. It was just the old kid bike, and it had been in the garage for how long? And uh, yeah, so they just figured someone might use it or just whatever. So they just yeah, I guess just like uh, you know, a little box of uh, hockey cards, right? <laughs> I guess so, right? <laughs> so so listen. Um, the reason I asked you to to really come on, like this, all this other stuff is really kind of cool, but. Uh, the reason I asked you to come on was because, and and I've asked you uh, personally with my bike, hey, what can I do here? What can I do there? With spring coming, um, you know, I'm wondering if people are going to put bikes to the to the side of the curb. But what should what should people do to make sure that um, you know the bikes are safe either for themselves or for their kids? Um, and and is it stuff that they could do at home? Like what are, what are some of the tips or easy things or or things that make people put these things on the side of the road that you kind of go look? Just spend ten minutes doing this. What is this? What, what would that be? Yeah. So the the main thing that I would say is that most of the bicycles that I get are neglected. And I said that earlier, and the, and the, and the main reason is, is that people don't take they don't even know how or don't take the time to lubricate things. Like uh, most things on a bicycle wear out because they're just not lubricated. Uh, and the main one being the chain. So the first thing I would tell people is do not use WD-40 on your chain. No, do, uh, no, w, no WD-40. No, WD-40 is not a chain lubricant. It evaporates. Hmm. So it's good for lots of things, um, but it actually will, will not lubricate your chain properly. So you can clean your chain with WD-40, but then you have to get some kind of a grease. Uh, and, and the best example I would tell you is when we were kids, you know, people used to, you know, they put that elastic around their pants because they want to get grease on yeah. their pants, right? Yeah. And, and kids don't have that problem anymore because nobody greases their chain. <laughs> <laughs> and what ends up happening is you get metal on metal and then uh, eventually the chain, the stretches are failed or it ruins the gears. Um, mm-hmm. So basically uh, the easiest thing that someone could do is you turn your bicycle upside down on a piece of cardboard and you clean the chain with W40 or any kind of a solvent, wipe it down, and then grease the inside of the chain that is in contact with the sprocket and the... And the uh, so so what kind of grease? Like, are you talking white grease or some sort of... No, um, you know, anyone who has, a, like, uh, any kind of a... You need a grease that doesn't wash away. Um, the best example I could give you is Princess Auto sells a... You know, Blue Max, they call it, and it's literally $4 for this giant tube that you'll never finish. Um, and, you know, it's just as good as any other, you know, specialty bike grease that, you know, you would pay three or four times the amount. Oh, okay. So, so like, if, if I'm just a regular person and I go shopping at Canadian Tire or, or one of the, you know, one of the popular sort of stores that, that, uh, that folks go to, you're, you're looking for... It, what is it called? Bite grease or chain grease? Or? No, you would just need you would just need some kind of a chain grease. Yeah, chain that, grease. that is not that is not not a not that white that white grease. Uh, okay. Yeah, so it would be hard to uh, hard to define exactly which one it is, but like I said, it's not usually that expensive, uh, and it's just a a grease that you would um, use specifically for chains. So is that is that the most common thing that people kind of go, hey, the bike doesn't work anymore. It's the chain. No, it's, it's something that will eventually break because it's not lubricated, right? right. So, uh, you know, wheels uh, don't really need much lubrication if they're if they're not really really old. Um, but just a little bit of WD-40 and some actual oil um, in in the uh, axle, uh, you know, once or twice a season will will, will expand the life uh, of a, of a wheel before you know make it not fail. 
<laughs> so what what uh, what does it mean if uh, if somebody because I've I've heard them before too. Somebody's going and, and they're changing the gears on the bike while they're they're riding, but the gears don't seem to quite change over or they make that clicking sound. Is that yeah, a because, poorly poorly greased chain? Because the chain isn't lubricated. Really? So when the chain isn't lubricated and you're trying to shift gears, nothing moves smoothly, so you get a lot of hard crunching metal on metal type shifts. And, um, and and the gears could possibly skip too, or the chain falls off, or things yeah. like that, right? Yeah. And again, that's all because of lubrication. This kind of neat. So, WD forty, which I was saying is not good for the chain, is good for a lot of other things on the bike. So, like, yeah, your cables. So basically, getting some WD forty into your into your shifter cables or your brake cables will free them up, and they'll, uh-huh. they'll work a lot better, especially if they're sticking due to rust. So how did how, listen? How did you figure all this stuff out? Was it trial and error, or you took an interest, or you started reading some books, or what? What was there? It was mostly try, trial and error. When, got, when things got more complicated, actually, nowadays, just finding a YouTube video, there's pretty much <laughs> everything available. Uh, and uh, yeah, I didn't have the right tools when I first started, uh, and then when you did get them, you realized a lot of things aren't that difficult. Um, I like working on older bikes because you can you can physically take them completely apart and put them all back together and everything gets back to uh, you know the original state. Where nowadays, especially most high end bikes, when something fails, you have to replace that component. It's not designed to uh, to be serviced. So, Carlo, is there ever a reason to, given what we're talking about, is there ever a reason to actually throw away a bike? I don't think so. I think there's always some some uh, someone else there who wants parts or wants to fix it. Uh, there's some kid who doesn't have a bike, so uh, again, uh, right. uh, there's always uh, a need. Again, you just have to prevent these things from going to the landfill. That's awesome. Listen, it sounds like you take a lot of pride in in what started out as a hobby, and it sounds like you're. Um, you know, you're helping some kids out too that, that don't have any, um, and by through the donations and the charity, and hopefully with some of the tips that you gave us today, uh, you'll save some bikes from even making it to the curbside, and, and people will not send them off to the landfill. Uh, and if they try to, then hopefully there's other folks like you that uh, are are collecting them and and reclaiming them and and fixing them up. So, uh, any last uh, any last advice before we uh, bring it to a conclusion? I just think uh, I've been having a lot of fun, and uh, like I said, the weather's getting nicer, and hopefully people will ride more. Right on. Stay safe, Carlo, and thanks for doing this for us. All right, thanks. All right. Bye, guys. Ciao. All right, there you have it, folks. Get the right tools. Use the right grease. Don't use WD-40 for what it's not meant for. And you've got some quick tips there to get ready for the summer and keep those bikes alive. Now, a quick word from one of our sponsors. Recipes at My Table is a work of family, love of food, and sharing of stories. The stories keep the memories alive and make every day a party in my kitchen. Join me for the sharing of traditional Italian recipes and so much more. There you have it, folks. That's Renata from RecipesAtMyTable.com. Check it out. Tons of freebies in terms of uh, recipes and tips. Really good stuff there. So you've heard about Chaser's Juice. How about Chaser's Fresh Juice Ice Pops? Summer is coming, folks. And what better way to cool down than a fresh, organic, made local with real fruit juice, no added sugar, ice pops. If you're interested in learning more, you can check them out at chasersjuice.com or give Richard a shout at 416-259-1557. You can also pick them up at your local McEwen's. Check it out, Chaser's Fresh Ice Pops. So we've come to the part of the podcast where I like to tell a little story. Usually it has something to do with something that happened to me, and so it's usually true. Uh, Sometimes it's funny, and sometimes it's just a life lesson. So let's see what this week's holds. So I thought, given my conversation with Ryan Walter, and we talked about many things, but one of the things we talked about was failure and what you do after you experience failure. Now, sometimes there's two sides to failure. You can fail yourself uh, or someone else can fail you. Um, the The story that I had in mind, um, and, and you can tie this back to 
career development and, and life choices as well. I go back to a long time ago, uh, not that long, but, but a long time ago. I was uh, in grade 10 and uh, you know, I was enjoying um, just being a teenager, I think. Um, I wasn't too serious about school. And, and one of the things that I wasn't too serious about was uh, math. And um, there was a, a class that I had in high school that uh, I hadn't done particularly well at, um, mostly because I, you know, didn't put the, the effort or the practice in that I was capable of putting in um, until the very end uh, where I, I knew that I could do just enough to pass the course. Um, so I did, I ended up, I ended up getting enough, uh, of a mark to pass the course. But, um, following that we had a, a parent teacher, um, type of interview, uh, to that effect. And, and my parents went in and I went in and, and the teacher, um, tells my parents and myself that, um, you know, I didn't do that great during the semester, but, uh, I had done enough to garner a 51 and a pass was a 50. Um, but he says, and, and he says, well, he had the capability to keep that mark or make that mark something else using whatever value systems that he was using to, uh, to grade us and that he had the power to do that. I still remember this, uh, this, this uh, conversation that he had the power to do that. And he was deciding that even though I had done enough at the end to garner a 51 that he was not going to give me that 51. In fact, he was going to give me 49 so that I just failed. And because he wanted me to experience failure that I, he thought that I had not yet in life experienced enough failure to take things seriously. And so I remember we didn't really fight it. My, my parents, there's, there's a, there's a cultural aspect to this, uh, because throughout the semester, I, I didn't really apply myself. And, and so in their mind, there was some, some sort of probably lesson learned as well to be had. Um, and they're listening to this individual who was in a position of power and telling them, you know, what he was going to do and why, but he didn't stop. He didn't stop just there. He went on to say that, because he was the dean or, or lead of the uh, math and computer science department, that he was going to put it on my record that I was to not take any advanced math courses for the rest of my high school days. But he didn't stop there either. He also went on to say that I was banned from taking any computer science course um, for the duration of my high school days because... He said to me and my parents, you will just fail. You will not have a good experience and you will fail. And so that was it. I, I didn't, um, you know, I ended up taking uh, basic math courses throughout the rest of high school and I was not allowed to take any computer science courses. So fast forward this a little bit. I'm, um, you know, well, the summer of the following summer, uh, heading into grade 11, um, not because of the math course, but just because of life in general. And I started thinking forward of, you know, career and what I might want to do with life. I thought, ah, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to start applying myself. And I did uh, throughout grade 11 to, to the graduating grade 13. Um, you know, I ended up uh, finishing with honors and, and getting a scholarship in university and, and, um, moving my life forward that way in a, in a successful manner. So, you know, of my own, of my own will and choosing and, and mindset and preparedness and awareness, uh, I went on to, um, really develop, um, my student, uh, life and career and, and, and knowledge and preparing. So I fast forward to university and, uh, I think a couple of months in, I get a call and they say, Hey, you got to go see the guidance counselor. We want to make sure you have all the right courses. Okay. Guidance counselor says, hey, um, you need to take either a science course, chemistry or, or something of the sort, or computer science. And I'm thinking, well, I wasn't allowed to take any computer science. I have no background in it. And, uh, you know, 
science wasn't my best subject in, in high school. I was more of a arts and, and uh, English and um, that type of, of uh, interest. And, and I had banned, been banned from <laughs> taking some courses. So I say, well, you know, my sister has a, a computer and I could probably utilize that tool. So I'll try computer science. And I start going to this computer science course and, and um, the professor was a fantastic professor. Uh, I just instantly understood the structure and mechanics and theory of computers and, and computer technology. And shortly thereafter in that course, I started taking apart my sister's computer and rebuilding it and adding things and removing things and learning different programming languages. Um, and I, I basically had fallen in love with, with uh, the knowledge that goes with computers and computer technology. Um, footnote, I had not taken and was not allowed to take any computer science courses in high school. So I finished university and I, I again, I, you know, I, I got my, my, uh, my degree there and I decide I'm going to go back uh, to college and pursue a computer engineering diploma. Um, and, and I do that and I, I was successful in that as well. Um, and I've spent probably the last... 25 years or so without dating myself of my life in a computer technology field where I utilize, by the way, math. The other thing that happened at university was that um, I started taking statistics courses and I did quite well at statistics courses, which involved a lot of math. Um, So at the end of the day, and when I look back and I think, you know, did I, did I way back you know, all those years earlier, did I fail myself? Yes. Yes, I failed myself in that I didn't put in the time and effort to, uh, to do what I needed to do to get more than 51. So I didn't have to have that conversation with that teacher. At the same time, was I failed by one of my leaders? Yes, I was. Because the leader only had the sight to look at what I was doing in that small period of time. And he didn't really want to or look at the bigger picture uh, of potentials or what else might be going on. His solution was, I'm going to make you fail. You're going to experience failure and I'm banning you from all these other things so, so that I don't have to deal with you. Um, so, you know, sometimes we fail ourselves, sometimes others fail us, and sometimes it's a little bit of, of both. At the end of the day, it is what you, um, you know, how, how you pursue things after failure. That wasn't the first nor the last time that I have experienced uh, dualities in, in failure. Uh, I have had those experiences um, at different times uh, in my career. Um, and I can tell you that the process to come out of those things isn't really all that different from what it was all those years ago, but recognizing that there's a process to get through those things is probably where the key is in, in future achievements. So there you have it, folks. You know, um, part, of, part of growing and understanding and self-awareness is understanding your own failures and admitting them and understanding how you get through them. So hopefully that story helped you out a little bit and you've connected uh, with it and, uh, and you've enjoyed it. And uh, to, the, uh, to the teacher way back then, um, I turned out okay. <laughs> At least I think I did and hopefully you all think I did too. Anyways, enjoy your day, folks. Take care. Okay, folks, so if you stuck with us to the end, I told you there would be a little bonus. What I have for you is a song to end the podcast. This is my daughter, Marina Perino. She's 12 years old. She wrote and performs this song. It's called It Might Never Be the Same Again, 12-year-old's take on COVID-19. You can hear it also at 
ReverbNation.com forward slash Marina Perino. The link will be in the podcast notes. Enjoy. It might never be the same again. So let's just remember the memories we had. We might not be able to do the things we used to. Sorry to say it's true. Those days when we go to stores and the music and always an hour. com forward slash Marina Perino if you want to listen to that song, just the song, and she's taking us out from our April podcast, and we hope you enjoyed the show, and look forward to talking to you next month. Take care, everybody. Stay safe.